welcome back. Um, okay, so today we're going to do chapter two and maybe even get through chapter four. I think I can get through this, bet, this book a little bit quicker um, because as you're probably finding out, there's not a whole lot of plot. Um, so reading it, it's just sort of kind of a, just a, a psychological reading of Holden Caulfield and trying to figure out what is it that he's so afraid of and he's hinting at it all the time uh, but you just have to kind of read into what he's not saying and then what he's uh, contradicting and then of course what he is saying um, but it's it's not always um, it, as much as he doesn't want to be a phony he's not always being completely honest and authentic either so um, when he gets to Spencer, and I, I think this is probably one of the funniest scenes I've ever read, and I, I always love reading this out loud. Of course, I won't do that with you, but um, I'll have to read some parts of it. You know, he, he goes over to Spencer's house, and one of the things that you learn um, when Mrs. Spencer opens the door, she, uh, you know, welcomes him, offers him some hot cocoa, and he says something about Mrs. Spencer really likes him, and at least he thinks she does. And so that ought to tell you that he's been here before, and that, um, you know, what he says about Spencer is not exactly the way he feels about him. And I think some people just read it kind of literally what happens and the confrontation that happens and they don't really think about uh, the fact that he he really wants to see Spencer. He goes to Spencer for a reason. And um, by the end of it, he he's not mad at Spencer, Mr. Spencer. So um, one of the first impressions, though, and this is something that comes up in his short stories, is the bathrobe. Here he is, he opens the door, he has the um, grip, which is like influenza. I'm just gonna read this part. Um, the minute I went in, I was sort of sorry I'd come. He was reading the Atlantic Monthly and sat, and there were pills and medicine all over the place, and everything smelled like Vic's nose drops. It was pretty depressing. I'm not too crazy about sick people anyway. What made it even more depressing, old Spencer had this very sad, ratty old bath robe that he was probably born in or something. I didn't much like seeing old guys in their pajamas and bath robes anyway. Their bumpy old chest always showing and their legs. Old guys' legs at beaches and places always look so white and unhairy. Um, and if you think about uh, it, the underlining theme here about not wanting to grow up and then seeing Spencer in this old robe he's probably had forever, you know, it's so old that Holden says that he was probably born in it or something. And that is sort of a symbol though of growing old and you know, looking, even though it's kind of comical, but it's true, you know, you're looking at you know, these bumpy old chest and hairless legs and these white legs or, or whatever on the beach. If you think about the first time when you were a kid and you went to the um, some kind of nursing home, and you're probably okay with seeing your grandparents um, as, as they've aged, but when you look around, and I, I always had this, and I know it, it happened with my own kids, they're kind of astonished as to how everyone looks so bad. It looks so depressing. But it's a reality. It's a reality that we just can't really comprehend because we think we put so much emphasis on beauty and material things and fashion, and nowadays, um, makeup. Girls are like can do extraordinary things with their their makeup, but if you're, you know, 70, 80 years old and you're still trying to do that, 
it, it's just going to look fake. You're going to look like a clown uh, because it, it just doesn't, there, there is no covering up that reality. It is what it is. And it is a scary thing because what does it represent? It represents death, withering, you know, and it's not the fresh rose that it once was. Now, this is what time does to all of us, unfortunately. And so he, um, he, looking at Spencer, he has to kind of come in terms with his own mortality, which I think is what's kind of in the back of his mind this whole time, this whole time, especially after the death of his brother. And then there's sort of this, you know, comical scene where he's, um, old Spencer is, uh, wanting to kind of get on to him about why he flunked him. And Holden's attitude is, I, I, he's like that detached kid that says, I, I know, I would have done the same thing. I don't blame you. And Spencer's still very, you know, defensive. Do you blame me? You know, because I think deep down Spencer hates the fact that he has to let Holden go. He knows there's something wrong, but there's also something in, in the generation between them. And Spencer is behaving just the way that you would expect a teacher, a professor, or, or parent to behave. That's the way that he was um, treated by his parents and teachers and so forth. And of course, th times are changing. Um, so when he says, well, what did Mr. Thurmer say to you? And he keeps calling him boy, which he doesn't like, but Holden is acting like a boy most of the time. And he says, well, he's, you know, he, he's talking about how life is a game. And it, just that, using that, you could say life is a lot of different things, a lot of different metaphors. By game, you have more of a material, uh, not material, but uh, a military regimen of life is played by the rules. I would prefer the metaphor that life is a dance. I like that one. But in this case, you know, being in this type of school and the kind of school, you know, Salinger went to, they had to march everywhere, things were very strict, and things are very cut and dry. You know, you, you do this and you'll achieve. And so if he brings up, you know, life being a game, my ass, you know, if you're on the side with all the hot shots, you know, if you're like his roommate, Stradlater, sure, you got a game. But if you're like Holden and Alki, it's not much of a game, you know, when you don't look right, you don't have, um, you don't possess all the right things, and, and it doesn't seem very fair. But it sounds like something that someone already, who has a lot, is able to say, oh yeah, it's, it's easy, it's just, you just do this, and this, this will happen. So um, he says that, and then he... Um, He asked about his parents, and and you can hear, you know, the kind of the detached sarcasm. Well, they'll be pretty irritated about it, I said. They really will. This is about the fourth school I've gone to. I shook my head. I shake my head quite a lot. Boy, I said. I always say boy quite a lot. Partly because I have a lousy vocabulary, and partly because I act quite young for my age sometimes. I was 16 then, but... I'm 17 now, and sometimes I act like I'm about 13. It's really ironical because I'm six foot two and have a half, and it's six foot two and a half, and I have gray hair. I really do. One side of my head, the right side, is full of millions of gray hair. Now, it's probably not millions of gray hair, but he may have some. And this is where he's contradicting about being. Um, contradictory about his maturity like he normally is like he gets upset if you treat him like a boy but sometimes he is and as as looking at it as a coming of age novel there isn't a certain day that you hit where you've suddenly matured and you're ready for everything it's a series it's and there's a a, a poem I forget it now but uh, she talks about how, you know, sometimes, no, this is a short story about a red sweater. And sometimes she feels like this, and sometimes she's 13, sometimes she's 6. Well, when we have our memories back to the things that embarrassed us or hurt us, 
It might be that six-year-old self. It might be that 13-year-old self. You know, that, that disappointment, whatever it is that it could be right now, you're at a certain age, and it doesn't mean that you don't, that you just suddenly act like you're six, maybe some people do, but it, it's, you're connecting that emotion with something that you felt when you were younger. And that's why it hurts maybe even more because, you know, it, there may be something else that's repressed there. And he certainly seems to have a lot of repression. Okay, so people, he says that, um, and yet sometimes I act like I'm about 12. Everybody says that, especially my father. And you also see later on when he's with his roommates, even Alki tells him to grow up. So he does act very immature, but he does it because he still wants to be a boy. And yet he doesn't want to be called boy, <laughs> you know. So um, then he says, people think it's all true. I don't give a damn, except that I get bored sometimes. He's always bored when he's kind of hurt by something too, when people tell me to act my age. Sometimes I act a lot older than I am. I really do, but people never notice it. People never notice anything. It seems like people only notice the bad things. They don't ever notice the good things. And so Spencer starts this nodding again. He also started picking his nose. He made out like he was only pinching it, but he was really getting the old thumb right in there. I guess he thought it was all right to do because it was only me in the room, and I didn't care, except it's pretty disgusting to watch somebody pick their nose. Then he said, I had the privilege of meeting your parents. And then he says, you know, they're grand people. And Holden says, that is a word I hate, grand. And um, then he asked him about, you know, what are you flunking? And notice he's flunking everything but English. I don't, and, and I think that when I was reading uh, the biography um, of, um, I've almost called him Holden, a Salinger, it, the grades that I saw for one year was pretty low in everything except English, of course. And uh, so he was talking to him and he says that, you know, he was kind of shooting the bull with them and um, he says, you know, I flunked you in history because you knew absolutely nothing. And he agreed to it, but then he does something, he starts to go get his paper and he's going to go do like the worst thing you could possibly do is read back the paper to a student. And uh, so he said, you choose to write about the you know Egyptians for an optional essay question. Would you like to hear what you had to say? No, sir, not very much, I said. He read it anyway, though. You couldn't stop a teacher when they wanted to do something. They just do it. So then he reads it, and then he says, this is you know, a dirty trick. I wouldn't have done it to him. And then uh, he stopped reading and put my paper down. I was beginning to sort of hate him. Your essay, shall we say, ends there, he said in this very sarcastic voice. You wouldn't think such an old guy would be so sarcastic and all. However, you dropped me a little note at the bottom of the page, he said. I know I did. I said, I said it very fast because I wanted to stop him before he started reading that out loud. But you couldn't stop him. He was hot as a firecracker. Dear Mr. Spencer, this is all I know about the Egyptians. I can't seem to get very interested in them, although your lectures are very interesting. It is all right with me if you flunk me, though as I'm flunking everything except English anyway. Respectfully, yours, Holden Coffin. He put my goddamn paper down and then looked at me like he just beaten the hell out of me out of ping pong or something. I don't think I'll ever forgive him for reading that crap out loud to me. He forgives him by the end of like the meeting in 15 minutes. And that right there you see is, is very much childlike quality. He's embarrassed. He gets upset. Um, he thinks he hates them, you know, and he thinks the worst. And, but when it, but it's all just, you know, just part of that growing up and trying to deal with your emotions. It's not, there's no uh, permanent response there. It's just, it, he goes back to kind of this childlike feeling um, while they're sort of both playing a role here if he's playing teacher and he's playing student. And 
then after that, he's, he says, you know, he was trying to, you know, talk, give him the bull, the whole, you know, thing about how if I was in his place and how most people don't appreciate how tough it is to be a teacher. And then he's wondering about the ducks in, um, about the lagoon in Central Park down near Central Park South. I was wondering if it would still be frozen over when I got home. And if it was, where did the ducks go? I was wondering where the ducks went when the lagoon got all icy and frozen over. I wondered if some guy came with a truck and took them away uh, to a zoo or something, or did they just fly away? Or did they, um, or if they just flew away? He brings this back up um, almost towards the end, and I'll go back to it and, and talk about it at that point, but think about that question about just where did the ducks go when the lake freezes over and try to think about that in terms of the kind of crisis that Holden is going through but I, I, I want you to try to think about it and <clears throat> I'll mention it when we get there so when he asks you know how do you feel about this and he says well you know says, you know I, it really hasn't even hit me yet I I don't know I mean I've been kicked out of these schools and he says don't you you know have any concern for your future boy oh I feel some concern for my future all right sure do sure I do I thought about it a minute but not too much I guess not too much I guess because you know if he did he would be doing better but he is worried about his future he just doesn't see this is his future you will said Spencer you will when it's too late I didn't like him hearing that and why I mean didn't like him saying that and why does he not not like hearing it because it's another reminder that you have to grow up you have to grow up you have to be an adult and uh, you know he has this Peter Pan syndrome he doesn't want to grow up and for good reason um, so he says well you know I'd like to put some sense in that head of yours and I'm trying and then he could say you know he really was too you could see um, that but we were just on the opposite sides of the pole that's all I know you are sir I said thanks a lot no kidding I, I appreciate it I really do and then he gets up and he says he's got to go somewhere and um, he lies and says he's gonna go somewhere and he does tell him you know look don't worry about me so you what you hear at that point is that he really does know that mr. Spencer cares about him he didn't want Mr. Spencer to feel bad about flunking him. Um, so you know that they have a relationship. But so, you know, for for what he what he says to describe him is not exactly what he means. And that's just one example of how he treats most situations that we get into. And then he says, I'll, you know, I'll drop you a line, uh, take care of your grip, and... Um, then the guy says, good luck, and he says, oh, I hate it when you, you know, that sounds terrible if you think about it. Um, so in the next chapter, you meet his roommate. He's trying to read a book. He's reading um, Out of Africa, by the way, which is another wonderful book. So um, Salinger has very good taste in literature. And he's mentioning, you know, here he is. It doesn't sound, Isaac Dennison doesn't sound like a very macho book. Uh, but it, it kind of is, you know, she's in Africa, and, but it's beautifully written. And so, of course, it's, it's like a shout out to, to her. And uh, his brother gave it, oh, no, he's talking about another book. Never, never mind, let me move on. So um, then he brings up Thomas Hardy, The Return of the Native. He reads classics. So you know he is literary and you know you, he can uh, write. In fact, Strad later is going to ask him to write his composition for him. So this guy, Alki, gets in there, and Alki is just one of these kind of um, disgusting characters who doesn't brush his teeth, which is also kind of a child-like, you know, quality that he has to be told, you know, you really should brush your teeth. And he doesn't, you know, really want to do that chore for some reason, but every time he's around people, he starts cleaning his fingernails. And Holden just sees it as this cover-up of trying to come off like he has good hygiene, but he doesn't. 
and he won't, you know, do what's, what's necessary. And he's just, you know, one of these annoying guys. And one of the things I love about Salinger is the dialogue, uh, because Salinger's so sarcastic, he really knows how to capture a, a scene. He doesn't do a whole lot of scenery, scenic pieces, but when you when you look at the interaction with people, you're right there in the room, and um, he doesn't hold back. You know, like he's when Alki says, "So how's the book?" You know, and that's really annoying for people who are reading or writing and someone's asking you, well, how's it going? <laughs> and he says, well, the sentence is terrific. And the truth is the sentence probably is terrific because it's Isaac, Isaac Dennison. It pro he probably is reading a, a hell of a sentence at that point. But anyways, um, he brings up the game. And, and also this is when we find out he's got his red hunting hat. And the red hunting hat is also something that he he can put on to maybe feel like he's somebody else. It becomes something he kind of hides behind. Um, as if he doesn't want to be seen, but then it's this red hunting hat and it's very noticeable and people are gonna ask him about it. But it's sort of his way of rebelling against what everybody else is doing. And you also kind of get to see the way that he behaves around his friends. Uh, rather than just talking about it, you see for yourself that Holden does act pretty um, immature. But he's funny, you know, he goes around with his hat, he covers his eyes, he pretends he's blind. He's, mother darling, give me your hand. Why won't you give me your hand? And, the, and Alki says, for Christ's sakes, grow up. And he's always kind of doing this because when um, Stradlater is getting ready for his uh, date, the continue, the continue date, um, he's like trying to put him in a headlock and the guy's shaving and he's going, stop playing around. Like, like he's always horsing around. Now, sometimes I bet the guys all horse around with them because they'll, they'll want to. Um, and, and it, it, you know, it, it does take guys, I think want to be young, uh, much for, for a longer period um, than, than girls. I think girls are um, maybe because they're expected to act older and, and to do things on their own, but guys seem to kind of know that when it's over, it's over. And so I got to enjoy this uh, before I become, you know, the responsible one and everything, all the, you know, stresses on my shoulders of the family and, and stuff like that, like financial. Um, things and I, I think it's just a it's a way of, of really wanting to hold on notice the name Holden he's holding back um, and so anyways they have this um, you know kind of playful interaction and Alki talks about how he can't stand um, Stradlater and and you see the contradiction that part of um, part of Holden agrees, but the other part says, you know, you know, every now and then he'll do something, he'll have a redeeming quality. Like, you know, if you really like his tie, he'd probably just take it off and give it to you. And Alki said, well, if I had that much money, I would too. And he says, no, you wouldn't. I wouldn't. If you had so much money, you'd be horrible, <laughs> you know? And, um, so this, he's got these really horrible manners too, that it seems like, um, Holden has a hard time with people not taking care of themselves like he's a little bit OCD which of course I would be too but he's the guy's cutting his fingernails and just leaving him on the floor he's irritated that the guy comes over borrows takes his stuff you know he had to go get the scissors that he already packed up it's just like this kind of person is just like how can I be more annoying and get you to do things that you don't want to do and that's kind of what he does until um, he sees uh, Stradlater come in, and then he's he's gone. Um, so then you get to you meet Stradlater, who's one of these guys who always appears. Like his way of describing it is like he's, if you saw his picture in the yearbook, he'd be really impressed. But in person, there were other guys 
who were better looking, but if you saw their picture in the yearbook, it wouldn't be the same. There's kind of this movie star quality about Stradlater that um, he resents because he hates the movies too. It's, it's kind of phony, but I think he's also a little bit jealous and he's gonna get more jealous because Stradlater is going on a date with Jane um, Gallagher. And this again, that like what he's not saying, he's not saying directly, I've been in love with this girl. I can't believe you're going. But just when he hears her name and he stops and he, he's like, I almost, you know, <laughs> felt like it was gonna pass out. Okay, so there you go. And then also there's, what, what does he like about Jane? He likes that she's innocent. And one of the symbolic things when they play checkers is that she doesn't move her kings. And I think that's, that's kind of um, showing you her, her own self-control maybe. And you get the idea that she is um, probably still a virgin. And she's, she, she's had a hard life. You don't know a whole lot, but there's little things that Holden was interested in that Stradler, hearing it, you know, could care less. And the only thing that interests Stradler is when she's, it was talking about like this horrible stepdad that ran around half naked. And he goes, oh. And, he, you know, that's not the sort of thing that Holden sees as, um, you know, just kind of the way she held herself. And you, you get the sense that this is one of those innocent, very innocent girls. And then the bad part of that is she's going out on a date with a guy that Holden says, he's the kind of guy that actually did, you know, make it all the way with girls. Other guys talked about it, but he actually did it. And this really bothers Holden. So, you know, you first you got this incident where he loses equipment and everybody hates him, you know, and then he, um, what, what you're going to see is it's once Stradler gets back, Stradlater, they get into a fight. And so you can tell this resentment about him going out with Jane is really bothering him. But it's especially bothering him because he knows how Stradlater is. So I'll stop there and then uh, we'll get back to when the guy gets back home.